evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this evening's McTaggart. I really hope you've enjoyed the festival so far, and I can't wait to tell you about some of the things we've got lined up tomorrow. The commissioning survey is back, um, and I'm really grateful that all five controllers have again agreed to share the stage and talk us through this year's results. There was such a buzz around that last year, and it really got me thinking about how good are we, the Indies. Um, and so to go alongside that session this year, we've also commissioned a survey where we've asked the freelance community and the commissioning editors what we, the Indies, are getting right, and, just as importantly, what we're getting wrong. How to be a better Indie is tomorrow morning at 9, and it's a session I'm really looking forward to. There's no doubt that it's been a year of huge change in telly. To me, it feels like there's barely a week that passes when we don't read about another global deal. Quite what that means for BBC quotas and for the industry as a whole is a session I would really urge you not to miss. That's tomorrow afternoon in the Pentland. We've also, of course, got tons and tons of talent for you to look forward to. Tomorrow is actually the 50th anniversary of Match of the Day, to the actual day, and Gary Lineker will be here to celebrate that. Uh, Dynamo is coming, and he's going to be performing magic tricks on you all in his masterclass. And John Bishop will be revealing the winners of this year's Edinburgh TV Awards. So I really hope you enjoy uh, the festival tomorrow. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome Elaine, who's here to introduce this evening's McTaggart. You know, I asked Melanie to be um, this year's advisory chair in circumstances that really do me no credit. Um, we were at a party in a field, um, and she was very merry. And I was fairly sure that she wouldn't be able to run away. Um, and probably just to get rid of me, she said yes. Um, but to her great credit, when she sobered up in the morning, she still said yes. Um, and she's done a brilliant job. Um, I warned her that uh, something was bound to happen to her in the year that she did the festival. It always seems to happen to the advisory chairs. It happened to me happened to the last three advisory chairs of this festival, and indeed uh, she has taken on a new supersized role as the chief executive of the T4 group, a much larger organisation now than it was a year ago, but she's done it all with the kind of tireless energy that leaves the rest of us exhausted. Um, so big thanks to her. I've been the executive chair of this festival for four years, and this is my last festival and my last McTaggart. <laughs> Thank you. I've been coming to Edinburgh for many years and probably still will come to Edinburgh for many years um, because the thing about it is there's nothing like it. Where else would you find Stefan Dom from Gogglebox rubbing shoulders with the Minister for Culture, Ed Vasey? Actually, that sounds like some weird kind of swingers party. Um, or Keith Lemon going through the controller's keyhole and getting tied up in Stuart Murphy's bedroom. Doesn't sound much better. But Edinburgh is also the place where the fiercest debates about the future of our industry take place. And many policies and reversals of policies have come out of this festival. It's also, of course, a charity. And we provide training for people who are just about to start out in television at a time when there's precious little training left in the industry. So it's been a real privilege to be the executive chair. And I must say thanks to my executive committee, most of whom have been with me for the entire four years, and to Louise and Lisa, my two festival directors, to the full-time team, and to someone who usually remains hidden. Um, the technical production of this festival, the sound, the vision, the management of the rooms and the crews, has been run with ruthless efficiency by one person for the last five years, and that person is, of course, a woman. Um, and her name is Nikki Clark, and she has done a fantastic job. I'm very... I'm very glad to say that the next executive chair of this festival is going to be someone who's long been a supporter and a loyal friend of the festival and of me, and that's Chris Shaw. I know he'll do a brilliant job, and I couldn't be more pleased that he'll be stepping into my shoes, although for the McTaggart, maybe a slightly lower heel. This year's McTaggart speaker is David Abraham, the chief executive of Channel 4. David has previously worked at Discovery, both here in the UK and in the US, where he was president and general manager of the US cable network, TLC. And before joining Channel 4 in 2010, he worked at UK TV, where he oversaw the rebranding of its channels, Alibi, Yesterday, Blighty, and the launch of Dave, where he championed commissions like Red Dwarf 
and in the land of the free. And as you might guess from those distinctive channel brand names, David began his career in advertising. At the age of 32, he became one of the founders of the independent creative agency, St. Luke's. St. Luke's, named after the patron saint of creativity, was established as an advertising agency with an ethical and social conscience. It was initi initially set up with no hierarchy, no real fixed working hours, no fixed desks. People working at the BBC might recognize this. Um, it was found to be unworkable at St. Luke's as well, apparently. <laughs> there's a book about the founding of St. Luke's, and in it there's a story about a staff meeting where everyone was encouraged to air any concerns they might have, even those who are unused to public speaking. And because David was used to public speaking, he made himself uncomfortable, apparently, by stripping off. Well, I'm glad to say, or maybe a bit sorry to say, that he's here fully clothed and very smartly dressed. David is the sixth chief executive in Channel 4's history, and we haven't had a McTaggart speaker from Channel 4 in 12 years. There's a lot to talk about. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome this year's McTaggart speaker, David Abraham. Well, thank you very much, Elaine, for that, uh, for that introduction, and to Mel and the festival committee for inviting me to give the McTaggart lecture this year. It really is a tremendous honour to be speaking both personally uh, and on behalf of Channel 4. Now at around the time that I started to, to think about this speech I went to see Mike Lee's forthcoming film, Mr Turner, about the great 19th century British artist. It's a fantastic film. I think it's going to be one of my creative highlights of the year. It also helped me to clarify what I wanted to talk about today. Because the film is a kind of love poem to a strand of independent British creativity. It tells the story of Turner's later life, how he kept evolving his art till the very end, how he dealt with his critics and his admirers, and how his art helped to change the way that we all see the world. Turner is played by Timothy Spall brilliantly as a complex creative soul. He's prickly, he's obsessive, but he's deeply human. There was one particular scene that really made an impression on me. Turner's living in this large house in Chelsea late in his life. He's surrounded by dozens and dozens of his paintings. He's visited by a tycoon. The tycoon walks into the house and literally pulls out a wad of five pound notes and says he's going to offer him a fortune, a hundred thousand pounds, to buy all of the remaining paintings in the collection. Turner looks up politely and he declines. The, the, the tycoon says, why? And Turner says, because these paintings have been bequeathed. To whom? asks the tycoon. And Turner answers, to the British people to be enjoyed all together in one place forever and for free. Now I think this scene brings out some quite complex feelings that many of us probably share. We want to do work that earns individual rewards, but also work that matters and is recognised at a collective level. Turner did not die poor, he did well from his art but he also valued it for something more than money. So this movie really pointed me towards the theme of this McTaggart. <coughs> because we do indeed still possess in this country and in this industry a unique and a precious balance between the collective and the commercial value of the work that we do. I think it's something to be proud of, not ashamed of, and it's definitely something worth preserving. Now, Film 4, brilliantly led, of course, by Tessa Ross, who's speaking here at the festival tomorrow before going off to run the National Theatre, is a co-producer of Mr Turner. And when I spoke to Mike Lee, he explained that months of early development were required without a script in collaboration between his cast, <coughs> art historians and painters. Film 4 paid for that development with what at the time was very little clarity about the shape of the project. 
Mike's explanation was film thought in a nutshell. Backing original hunches from talented people that go on to challenge and inspire the public. And behind Film 4 lies the Channel 4 Corporation, a globally unique phenomenon, a publicly owned but independent institution that pays its own way with a formal remit to innovate and to finance independent producers to take creative risks. So here we have a film about an independent risk-taking artist, made by an independent risk-taking director, developed by an independent risk-taking film company, and backed by an independent risk-taking broadcaster. Now, how great, how rare, and how bloody British is that? In preparing this speech, I've also been looking back on my own working life. You've heard a bit about it already. There's a strong thread. I've always admired and greatly enjoyed supporting people who repeatedly, almost obsessively, take on the challenge of pursuing new creative ideas. It's an activity that I've been lucky to practice on two continents and in three media, advertising, television, and film. Standing up for creative risks in the commercial world is essentially the way that I've earned my living for the past 30 years. I've always worked at companies where we believe that an original idea will outshine a predictable one in the end, and that it can make up for not having the biggest budget as well. Such work, which is desirably difficult, creates its own rewards. When I graduated, I intended to become a, a documentary producer, but I have to be honest, I failed to secure the basic training that I needed. I was actually rejected by Middlesex Polytechnic uh, I've still got the, uh, the rejection letter on my, uh, on my toilet door at home. No matter, a friend of mine suggested advertising as a good alternative path into the creative world, and so it proved. A really great environment in which to learn how to develop ideas with impact. In my very first job in advertising in the 1980s, when characters like Don Draper really were still in charge, I was told, in all seriousness, to actually not even come back to the office unless the creative work was sold to the client unchanged. And this was pretty <coughs> character forming. Since then, I found myself in some pretty interesting situations. Like when my American bosses took a very dim view when I, uh, I ran a 10 part series on Discovery Channel about the science of sex. Uh, and I promoted it with a very big poster campaign that explained that it would be not very stimulating. Well, when I noticed the look of regret on the faces of the board of UKTV in my very first meeting, and I told them of my plans to launch a TV channel and name it after myself. <laughs> or when Louise Mensch, remember her? She hair-dried me in a select committee for daring to defend the satire of Frankie Boyle. In each of my jobs, the creative bit and the money-making bit and the relationship between the two have worked in subtly different ways. As a co-founder of an ad agency in the 1990s, it was just about using great ideas at first to survive as an independent business and then to grow. A discovery is about developing a global brand that stood for quality and maximizing its value to paying subscribers. And at UKTV, it was about balancing the duties of the BBC with the needs of private joint venture partners. In each of these situations, I was able to observe and learn how differently creativity can be valued. Fear and blame, for example, are both poison to healthy creative environments. Also, different attitudes toward experimentation and creative risk-taking do separate our culture from that of corporate America. At Channel 4, I have always believed that defending a tradition of freedom to push creative boundaries in an atmosphere of constructive criticism and support is the number one requirement of the job. Now, in recent years, we've seen a parade of Americans standing up here at the McTaggart telling us how things ought to be done. But how do you explain the number of US entities queuing up to buy our producers and now our broadcasters? Doesn't this suggest that maybe, as with our gun laws and our health system, it's us who are showing them 
how things ought to be done? I believe it's the brilliance of how we in this country have balanced private and public risk-taking that has set free the creativity and talent that the Americans are so keen to invest in. Would Netflix, for example, have bought a show about a murderous politician who broke the fourth wall of TV drama had the BBC not taken that risky decision decades before? My point is not to wrap ourselves now in a Union Jack or a Saltire. It's about focusing now on the very principles which have created much of this economic value in the first place and about us doing the hard thinking now about how to maintain and grow that system in a world that's got bigger and much more consolidated. Now, 2014, it just could be going down as the peak year in the gold rush of British television. In just a few months, we've seen a spate of deals that will reshape our industry and alter where decisions get made and by whom. Diversity of ownership on both the supply and the buying side of our industry is reducing rapidly. Consolidation is driving ever bigger bets. Our free-to-air channels have become the must-have accessories, the tiny dogs of 2014 amongst US media companies eager to stay ahead of each other by internationalizing their revenues, priming their distribution pipes, and of course, shielding their tax exposure. So Channel 5 now takes its orders from Viacom in New York. Liberty and other US shareholders are trying to play footsie with ITV. Now this could eventually put Britain's largest commercial channel in the hands of Dr. John Malone, a resident of Colorado, who also now controls the UK's cable platform, Virgin Media, our largest producer, all three, and Discovery. Now, incidentally, and in the interests of widening our pool of McTaggart bogeymen, he's also understood to be the largest landowner in America. He was nicknamed by Al Gore as Darth Vader. He holds net debts in his business of $41 billion, and he's quite well known for not liking to pay tax. Now, it may be on hold for now, but if... Fox, Time Warner, Shine, Endemol, all were to have merged. Might still happen. How long before that would subsume Sky Europe? Presumably all taking sensitive, nuanced direction from a Murdoch in New York. By the way, that entity would have combined revenues three and a half times the size of the entire UK television industry. Just think about that for a moment. TV is clearly now a combat vehicle for tech and mobile companies and platforms to compete with each other, rather than a sovereign industry in its own right. An Apple-Disney merger would substantially dwarf Fox Warner Sky. But what duties or obligations will these new global gated communities have towards our industry, whose future they increasingly influence? What level of accountability and responsibility are we prepared to expect from platforms that operate across technical and geographical boundaries. And how could we expect people whose idea of a, of a good time is a 24-hour is a codathon to understand the needs of the UK television audience? Our independent sector, built up and nurtured over decades, is being snapped up almost wholesale and acquired by global networks and sold by private equity investors at a faster rate than tickets to a public flogging of Jeremy Clarkson. Several owners have admitted to me privately that even they, as they sell, cannot fully understand the thinking behind how their companies are actually valued. It's estimated that the proportion of turnover of UK production that will qualify as independent will drop from around three quarters to around a half. The term super indie has in effect become redundant. They're just now indies and there are studios. The truth is that UK production has turned in 20 years from an ugly duckling into a very valuable goose indeed. One that as a result of hard work and talent has laid some very valuable golden eggs. But while recognising how powerful and desirable the world force UK production has become, I want to use my speech today 
to make two crucial points. Firstly, we might just be kidding ourselves if we think that all this happened by hard work and talent alone. The flowering of UK companies to push creative boundaries has been made possible by enlightened politicians and regulators backed by huge public support. That's the remarkable thing. Their wisdom and foresight has created our unique PSB system with its plurality of organisations and owners and its variety of missions and business models. It's also a settlement through which broadcasters are incentivised to create public service content with the carrot of prominence and access to the airwaves. At the centre of this, of course, is the BBC, funded by the licence fee. And we hear a lot from those who would do it down. And maybe it should be taking more risks and rattling more cages. Yet when you ask the public, it's one of the best loved brands in the country and it's seen as good value for money. It has its contradictions, yes, but there's always much to admire. My second point is that the system now risks becoming a victim of its own success. While UK production is an undoubted commercial success story, I wonder if it will continue to be a creative one. Scale demands an increased focus on cost cutting and margins. Reformatting of ideas is more efficient than the messy business of finding new ones. Fear of risk can overtake an appetite for it. Will the next generation of TV execs in this room have the same opportunities as the last? Or will they be so starved of quality scripts that they'll have to submit their own police dramas under gender-reversed pseudonyms like Ruby Solomon, for example? I'm looking forward to the series. And what about those of you who don't plan to get rich? You just have a quite reasonable expectation of working in a vibrant industry and doing interesting and original work. Now, in addition to the uncertainty that all these deals create, my belief is that much of the value of the companies that are being bought has depended on creative freedom and independence. This, in turn, blossomed in large reservoirs of creative risk capital. Creative competition has driven innovation, all to the benefit of the UK viewer. Now, the PSBs, of course, aren't the only broadcasters to invest in UK content. However, a look at the numbers alone shows who really takes more risks. Although total pay TV revenues in the UK dwarf those of the PSB sector, 80% of the 1.7 billion spent on original commissions from UK producers in 2013 came from the PSBs. The other 20% of it, 381 million, went to UK Indies from multi-channel players in total. Meanwhile, Sky <coughs> gave back £750 million to its shareholders in the last financial year. Channel 4 is different. Although also commercially funded, it's a not-for-profit organisation. This means we spend our revenues on screen rather than on shareholders. And as a publisher broadcaster, we can and we do spend the majority of that with UK producers. But let's imagine for a moment what a profit maximising Channel 4 would look like. To deliver, say, a 20% margin. I take fewer creative risks with far fewer companies. I would push acquisitions, repeats and ad funded programmes. And I'd minimise public service obligations as ITV and Channel 5 have done over the years. I'd have to take a load of production in-house, obviously. But is that what viewers, producers and advertisers really want? I'm quite sure my shareholders would want it all done quicker than you could say Dickie Desmond. Channel 4 has a great brand heritage, and so some viewers might not notice for a bit. But pretty fast, they'd wake up and they'd realise Britain had another Channel 5. And who would Channel 5 copy then? In Britain, we value some things beyond money alone, just as Turner did. That's always been true in the field of culture, and it's true in other areas as well. For example, when Pfizer made its recent bid for AstraZeneca, concern rapidly crystallised 
around the risks to the UK's pharmaceutical research and development base. AstraZeneca is a British company that invests heavily in R&D here. They support a research base, both private and embedded in a raft of university research departments which pull through the generations of scientists following behind. By the way, most of them were probably cruelly rejected by Middlesex Polytechnic. <laughs> Once lost, it's almost impossible to replace. Channel 4 is the UK's increasingly precious example of this in television, supporting over 350 companies across the UK, generating over 25,000 jobs and driving a significant proportion of the export value of our entire creative industries. And, as is evident from the current challenges of local television, building new, sustainable models that deliver public purposes is incredibly hard and it's incredibly rare. Talking of which, London Live. Wow. A television channel dedicated to the most vibrant city on earth with fewer viewers than a pole dark rerun. Now, in the weeks ahead, we'll be publishing a report looking at Channel 4's risk-taking role in television. And one of the many things it looks at is the government's approach to stimulating R&D and innovation across all industries. The conclusion? If you didn't have a Channel 4 in the creative industries already, the strategy would probably lead you to create one. My personal experience over the past four years has been that the UK government is a wise owner of Channel 4. It does not interfere with us editorially. Oversight is delegated to Ofcom and their appointed chair and non-exec directors. The system works. In short, we believe in our not-for-profit model. Most of all, we believe in our unique public service remit given to us by Parliament to be innovative, to be distinctive, or to put it another way to take creative risks. That gave us train spotting, GBH, the Desmonds, Brass Eye, Big Breakfast, Ali G, Channel 4 News, and Dispatches. Today it's still giving Black Mirror, Educating Yorkshire, The Last Leg, The Undateables, Complicit, 12 Years a Slave, and yes, Channel 4 News and Dispatches. For me, to have been part of the 2012 Paralympic Games was extraordinary. It changed forever the way that I see the world. And it tells me that the remit is as relevant and as necessary now as it's ever been. Even in a world of hundreds of homogenous channels and the internet. Times change and roles change. And back in the halcyon days of four or five channels, yes, I can see the mist forming in your eyes up there in the back row. Channel 4 was the alternative, with a capital A. Yes, we're still here to keep the BBC on its toes. The BBC Trust says we're doing that pretty well in current affairs at the moment, for example. And that will always be part of what Channel 4 is for. But we also now have a role at the front edge of the mainstream, giving the whole nation new ways of seeing the world. Ways that are challenging rather than familiar, contemporary over nostalgic and popular rather than niche. What really struck me about Benefit Street was the way it engaged so deeply on the right and on the left of politics, but with mass audiences at the same time. So I'd now like to give you a short break and a break with the traditions of this lecture. This is a Channel 4 uh, TV uh, event after all and show you a piece of inspiring Channel 4 creativity. It's made by our in-house creative team who are brilliant and who are led by Dan Brooke. He found it tremendously difficult to speak and he was incredibly badly teased. Because he didn't have a voice then. And he's got one now. To laugh is to risk appearing the fool. To weep is to risk being called sentimental. Uh, to reach out to another is to risk involvement. To expose feelings is to, is to risk exposing your true self. To place your ideas, your dreams in front of a crowd is to risk being called naive. To try is to risk failure. To live 
asterisk dying. But the greatest risk in life is to risk nothing. The person who risks nothing does nothing, has nothing, and becomes nothing. Only the person who risks is truly free. Channel 4 was set up to take creative risks and put its profits back into programs. We were born to experiment, born to change, born risky. Now that's work that makes me really proud. And it's work that's delivered one of our largest award halls ever across multiple genres. And stronger public approval of the four brand than we've seen for many years. And this is the result of the patience and skill of Jay Hunt and her team and all the great producers who work with us. When I arrived at Horseferry Road in 2010, people said that Channel 4 was a busted flush an enormous Big Brother-shaped sinkhole in the schedule and an empty begging bowl in the boardroom. But for the past four years, we've kept our annual revenues above 900 million a year throughout a long recession and we have nurtured our reserves. We've been spending record amounts on UK content with a very wide range of indies and after a period of investing, we'll be back in surplus this year. Channel 4 now is now up in peak and portfolio 16 to 34 share is the highest it's been for a decade or more. Most of our best rating shows are new ones and we have strong commercial partnerships with UK TV and BT Sport. Now who would have bet on all of that when Big Brother ended? Looking back, perhaps I underestimated the time it takes to replace franchises on a terrestrial channel. It took ITV time to build their audiences back up and fair play to them on their success. But Jay and I are also persistent while aiming to be different too. We've shown we can deliver the remit with impact and without public money for programs. And we'll carry on doing it even as we evolve creatively and digitally. <laughs> now over the past few years I've been encouraging the TV industry to embrace the power of data for example. Now, hold on, I hope some of you are impressed. I think that's a good 20 minutes before I mention the D word. <laughs> a TV channel without a data strategy is like a submarine without sonar. And 11 million people have now signed up to four, including half of all 16 to 24 year olds. What's the point? Well, we can personalize, which works for viewers and advertisers. And it means we pay for even more programs. Control of data also helps to fight off those who would burgle the relationship that our viewers have with our brands and many of your productions. This is how we will all have to compete in the future. Or you could, as a producer, invest your own money in your own content and then share almost half the income with YouTube, for example. Well, good luck with that model, everyone. We were innovators with 4AD, but our strategy is now evolving. We think that when broadcasters separate online brands from channel brands, they end up doing the splits. We also think the future is not about either the decline of linear and the rise of on-demand. It will be about the blend of both, using the strengths of each. So from next year, we will seamlessly unite all of our channels and services in one place in the online world. It will be an elegant design solution to a knotty problem that I think the whole industry is facing. And this process of change has shown us what we knew instinctively, that it's also time to change how we think about our public service delivery. Judging it via Channel 4 alone just doesn't make sense any longer. It's analog thinking in a world that's gone digital. We've gone some way down the road of this being recognized, but we want it to go a lot further. So we'll be talking to Ofcom about that in the forthcoming PSB review. After all, it wasn't just Channel 4, but our entire digital estate that delivered the power of the Paralympics. Soon, we will do the same with brilliant new dramas from Russell T. Davis, Cucumber, Banana, and Tofu, telling overlapping stories of different generations of gay people in Britain today. Now, that just would not have been possible back in the day of Queer as Folk. We're constantly changing the ways in which we reach our audience. Via short form, for example, which we have just ramped up, or on E4, 
Young people, now the most diverse group in the UK, see it as a terrestrial channel for them. So we'll invest further in E4 next year, which is good for them and good for the PSB system. Not least because there's radioactive waste stored two miles underground, buried less thoroughly than BBC3 will be. So, at four, we plan to keep pushing ahead and keep delivering. And we need new freedoms to keep experimenting. But we're being asked by regulators and stakeholders, how can the whole system of which we're part, the public service broadcasting system, be strengthened even further and help create new jobs, new ideas, new thinking for the future of the UK? Indeed, at least once a decade, we've returned here to Edinburgh to this most central of questions. What is the best way to organize ourselves so as to maximize the creative potential of this medium in this country and in accordance with our national appetite for creative and distinctive British content? The more UK content creation is, the better. Everyone wins. And it's equally clear that the PSBs are the most effective at delivering it. We spend much more across more genres with more certainty. We also, we also take many more creative risks. It's baked into our numerical obligations, but it's also hardwired into who we are. Recent government measures have focused on tax breaks to support inward investment for production in the UK. But bringing American movie and drama productions here is great for jobs in the same way as making iPhones in China is great for China. But the IP and the profits well, they're on the first boat out of here. In contrast, PSB investment is the nation's investment, based on our spectrum and two broadcasters that we, the public, own outright. With the next PSB review and the next charter round, we have a critical opportunity to update the PSB settlement for a new era, to strengthen it and to help the whole UK creative economy to continue to grow. Today, I'd like to talk about two areas that we believe can make a real difference. And there's only time to set out some broad principles. But don't worry, Steve Hewlett will be here in the Q&A to explain the detail to everyone, including me. The first is a fair deal on platform relations. Many parts of the television ecosystem benefit from the PSB's huge investment in content, including pay TV platforms which generated £5.9 billion last year in subscription revenues from UK households. These same households spend on average more time watching the box than anything else they do in their lives apart from sleeping and working. And in total, more of that time is spent watching the PSB channels than any other. So I think it's reasonable to say that pay TV subscribers like what we do, which is presumably why pay platforms are already paying us for valuable services like E4 HD and 4OD. So let's consider a simple question. How much do you think the pay TV platforms pay for the most popular services, the core PSB channels? Well, I'll tell you, zero. In fact, it's worse than that. With Sky, the PSB still have to pay unless we trade valuable services in return. It's just bizarre, isn't it? It undervalues the UK creative economy, of which we are all part, and that simply cannot be right. It's certainly not considered right in other countries, no. In fact, the UK is now one of the few major markets in the world where public service broadcasters receive no payment for the immense value their channels bring to pay platforms. Now is the time to correct this, and we need new rules to do it. Why more regulation? Why couldn't it just be an open negotiation between the two parties, no pay, no play? The problem with this is that there's an imbalance in the scale, obligations and incentives on each side of the table. More significantly, at Channel 4, we face a strong constraint in terms of our responsibility to the public not to withdraw our services from platforms. Our unique remit set out in legislation together with our duty to be universally available would undermine what in the commercial world would be a straight arm wrestle. This is why we need regulation at a minimum to act as a backstop if the parties cannot reach an independent agreement. And I look forward to discussing this 
with Ofcom and with the government in the months ahead. And I commit, here and now, here in Edinburgh, that every single penny of a fair deal on platform relations that came out of these negotiations would be spent on commissioning more UK original content with UK producers. The second area is a fair deal on terms of trade. Now at Channel 4 we're proud to have been a key player in developing the UK indie sector and we want to continue to see it growing by ensuring fair values return to producers for creative endeavour. But as Tony Hall recently pointed out, the old settlement on terms of trade reflected the markets of the time. An absence of competition, strong broadcasters, weak indies, fledgling cable and satellite companies. Today, if Danny Cohen thinks that the BBC is dwarfed by the major studios, can you imagine how the world looks from my office? We agree that it is the right time to step back and to reset to ask ourselves questions now about what form our relationship with producers should take. In doing so, we would start from four basic principles. Firstly, we don't intend to follow others and set up in-house production. So breathe easy, everyone. That's one less thing to worry about. Secondly, that the health and diversity of the indie sector is critical to Channel 4 because of our reliance on it for our lifeblood. Thirdly, smaller companies need a special level of support and protection when participating in a market characterised by big players, many of whom are connected to broadcasters, especially when another big beast, BBC Production Limited, is poised to enter, accompanied by the BBC's call for a level playing field. Incidentally, when I ran TLC, my biggest producer was BBC Productions in New York. And I think it would be a mistake to underestimate them. Fourthly and finally, as the market changes around us, flexibility to evolve our deal terms is becoming increasingly important for the future of four. We are looking for a regime that allows us to make the best of the opportunity to innovate new digital services. This benefits audiences and advertisers and also allows us to earn a fair return on the risk capital that we invest in developing, commissioning, and marketing new shows. So, we will look to Ofcom to devise measures for a healthy and diverse market for programme supply in the future. Many things won't need to be changed at all. For example, the presumption that Indies will own the copyright in programmes and control how international distribution is managed. Some of the things that we envisage in the package of support for smaller companies may even represent a more favourable position than exists today. Other parts of our arrangements will also change. For example, in how we make sure that we don't let old definitions of primary and secondary rights get in the way of delivering what we need for advertisers and audiences in the UK. All of this is designed to grow the total commercial value available and share that value fairly. This enables us to spend as much as we possibly can investing in new content and now directly into creative individuals as well. In my experience, the most creative people would rather stay independent for as long as possible, even if they do have an eye long term on the exit. Freedom combined with hunger drives creativity. But in time, ambitious companies also realise the need for capital to expand internationally or beyond a single genre, for example. The new Channel 4 Growth Fund is a much needed facilitator for this stage in the development of creative companies. Our investees remain in complete control of their own destinies and are free to act independently on distribution. They're also free to work with whomever they like as well without output deals tied to us. Now I began today by talking about our independent tradition of British creativity. So I now want to bring this back to some of the, the creative people who generate new ideas in our industry today. The first people Channel 4 is backing directly with the Growth Fund. This is Colin Boxham, Rory Wheeler, and Emma Pierce. They run Popcorn, it's a new company, doing great documentaries and some great branded content. And we're gonna be working with them and helping them expand their business 
and to develop creatively and commercially. This is Andrew Sheldon, Jess Fowl, and Mark Allen. And over the last few years, they've been building True North into a highly respected regional indie based in Leeds. They're now in partnership with Channel 4 through the Growth Fund and are looking to expand both in terms of their international footprint and in terms of their genres too. John Smithson, Ian Pelling and Tom Brisley. They've been doing some of the best specialist factual programming in the world over the last few decades. Recently they formed Arrow and they're now working with us on expanding uh, their business in the future. Simon Chin is a London-based, Oscar-winning documentary producer who set up Lightbox with Jonathan Chin in Los Angeles. They already have series in production in America and they're now going to be expanding in partnership with the Growth Fund. So this is a very exciting but just first wave of a great British creative talent backed by the fund. What we will do is help support their growth over time and redirect all the future returns back into either making more programmes or investing in new companies. It's as simple as that. And as part of our wider contribution to the diversity of British television, expect to see companies in the nations and companies led by BAME talent receiving serious investments from the Channel 4 Growth Fund as well. To support such companies would be a fantastic legacy of the fund. Which brings me to the other D word, diversity. And I speak here as someone whose parents came to this country in the 1950s, and I know that this country has given me many great opportunities. At Channel 4, we've had many diversity firsts. The first black sitcom, the first lesbian kiss, the first disabled and transgender winners of mainstream entertainment shows, and the first portrayal of Paralympians as superhuman. These symbolic game changers has, have transformed the psyche of our nation, but not of our industry, I fear. As a board member of Creative Skillset, I was as concerned as anyone that the number of people from ethnic minorities working in television has been falling. This isn't just a failure of retention, it's a collective failure to grow our talent pool when we get things right, the results are spectacular. Britain's Steve McQueen becoming the first black director to win the Best Picture Oscar. It just wasn't a triumph only of cinematic art. It was a triumph of imagination over business as usual. And a moment has come, thanks to Lenny Henry and many others, where we all agree that it's time for change, concerted and collective change. One big step has been a successful creative industries bid for government co-funding into skills that Channel 4 has recently supported. This will help to create many new opportunities and develop the careers of thousands of people over the next few years, at entry level and equally importantly, all the way through to leadership. <coughs> I also fully support the joined up industry approach that the CDN under Adam Crozier's leadership has recently set out. Next year, through the new Silvermouse monitoring system, we will finally know continuously and exactly who is on British television and who makes it. The lights will go on. And when people see more clearly, they think more clearly. They'll become more conscious of unconscious bias and minds will open up to new creative possibilities. We also like the BFI's Three Tick Initiative and we're developing a similar approach for television. We'll be announcing our own set of detailed proposals this autumn aimed at encouraging our commissioners and producers to think even more imaginatively about creative decisions across multiple aspects of diversity and multiple genres. <coughs> In the meantime, let me be clear. A successful diversity strategy is about increasing, not limiting creative freedom. It's about nurturing new talent and giving voice to untold stories. What we all need now is joined up action across our industry, and that's why I'm so determined to work with my fellow CEOs to push this mission across broadcasting. So, we are a great creative nation. We thrive in our unique climate of creative freedom and risk taking. 
We prize money, yes, but something bigger too. Something that fills not just pockets, but millions of hearts and minds as well, just as Turner did almost 200 years ago. I see that spirit alive today here in this room, and I'm proud to be part of it. As the great inventions of John Logie Baird and Tim Berners-Lee converge, another great invention of ours, the public service broadcasting system, has created the best conditions for creative program making on this planet. It has helped to turn the content we all create into gold. The world is rushing in, and that's wonderful, but a word of warning. This special landscape of ours did not, as I have said, happen by accident. We should not assume that left purely to the market, it will continue to thrive. To keep the PSB system growing, we need to nurture, not neglect it. Today, I've set out ways in which we, Channel 4, are doing that. But we aren't doing it alone. No one single person or company can. We need politicians and we need regulators to act. They've done it before and they must do it again, or the public will not thank them. So I call on them to act and to act decisively. Update and strengthen the PSB system, the system that has delivered so spectacularly for UK viewers and for UK PLC. And I call on you to do everything you can to persuade them. If you care about creativity, speak up and speak up now. Stay silent and our special system may wither. Once gone, it will never come back. This TV festival is a wonderful showcase for the very best creative ideas, teams and skills that we have to offer today. At its best, it's where the most important debates begin about what we value and where we are heading next. So I urge you, let's have this debate and let's have it right now. To paraphrase Madeleine Albright, there's a special place reserved in hell for those who succeed and don't put down a ladder for those coming behind them. So let's avoid any risk that someone in a suit might look back from this podium in a decade or so and say that the end of the story began here. Let's not miss the signs or screw up the system. Let's make damn sure that we nurture the potential of everyone here who is under the age of 30. You are television's turners of tomorrow, the future of great British creativity. Thank you.